Amen. You know, the, the strange thing is um, there's a part of me that wants to say, please stand with us. Uh, the truth is you can stand, uh, you can sit, you actually may be lying in bed right now. Um, I would encourage you, this is not a performance. Um, we are not performers. And Mary was mentioning how strange this feels for all of us. Normally we have you singing with us. Um, so I would encourage you to turn us up uh, and sing yourself and really spend this time worshiping God. Uh, we want this to be about him. We want him to be exalted now. So let's sing. Oh, we look to the sun Jesus, I'm 
sound of angels on the sound of angels on the all this for a king we could join and sing all to Christ our King time for offering um, but that now that you're at home um, I just want to encourage you as we worship as we go through these songs and we're singing um, praises to him I ask you to look inside yourself and see if you're giving God your best back in the Old Testament when they did offerings it had to be the f firstborn and without blemishes N nothing could be wrong only the utmost perfect perfect for for Christ and it's the same way here. And I feel like often Sunday mornings, you know, drag. We're like, oh, we got to get out of bed. Or today, maybe you don't. But, um, <laughs> but normally, you know, you know, last week, you know, service was a half hour earlier. We're cutting into that sleep time. But this is for God. This is not for the church. This is not, um, not even for, you know, the community. It's for God. So when you're getting up in the morning, you should be, thank you, God, for another breath, for another day that I get to live my life for you. Um, in my devotion uh, this week, the pastor said, too many times in too many places, we are willing to bring mediocrity to the worship of God. Near enough is not good enough. So with that, uh, we will sing our next song.
reflect that Lord may we live our life professing not only with our words but with our actions that we believe that you were the perfect sacrifice for us so that we could join you in eternity Lord I pray right now for Pastor Mark as he comes forward to give us your word Lord that you may speak through him Lord and fill us at home and here uh, with your Holy Spirit Lord that we may put aside anything that's distracting us tugging at our um, attention Lord that we may focus on you and give you our very best in your name I pray. Amen. Well, there is a big part of me that wants to say children are dismissed for junior church at this time. I guess if you have kids at home, they are free to uh, go do whatever. Uh, it is great to be able to connect at least over the internet. Um, as Christian said, it was a you know, hard decision the board had to make about what to do for today. Uh, they were calling for excessive heat. As a matter of fact, when I checked this morning, about 6.30 this morning, they were calling for it to be 99 degrees real feel by 11 o'clock this morning, 103 by noon. And uh, so you guys would have been leaving uh, church at about 100 degrees. And um, as a couple people pointed out, what we didn't want was people passing out, an ambulance coming, people putting their health in danger. So uh, I hope you have air conditioning, at the very least, a nice big fan pointed at you. Um, and we are thankful that you've chosen to join us, whether through Facebook or YouTube, um, that you're with us today. 
Well, over a decade ago, I was working on a Bible study, and I decided to Google the word that was the focus of it. I'll sometimes do this, and sin was the word that week. Uh, Matter of fact, I did it again this week to see how things had changed over 10, 15 years. The nice thing was this time, the first page was almost all Christian websites, so the first one was Wikipedia, but after that, Desiring God, which is John Piper's site, some other good ones. But when I looked 10, 15 years ago, uh, the number, the top sites were actually for a movie coming out, Sin City. Number five on Google's list, it said sin in bold letters, and then it said underneath official site. <laughs> that got me wondering and ends up that there was a video game called Sin, and this was the site for it. Well, on Google's second page, I learned that our northern neighbors, Canada, have a government-sponsored SIN program. Ends up their version of a social security card is what they call a social insurance number or SIN. I mean, seriously, Canada, couldn't you come up with something better than a SIN card? Like, use the letter U and make it a SUN card. That sounds nice and cheery. And how much confusion has this led to? Imagine patients, their first time with a new psychiatrist. And they're sitting there, a psychiatrist says, now, uh, what's your sin? I got to tell you, Doc, I, since childhood, I've just been, I'm a liar. I just, I lie all the time. It's, uh, no, no, your social insurance number. I need this to bill your insurance company. Well, sin just does not sound good in any form. And Christian reader, Lillian Holcomb writes, at bedtime, I tell our two grandsons a Bible story. One night I said, tonight we're going to talk about sin. Do you know what the word sin means? Seven-year-old Keith spoke up, it's when you do something bad. Four-year-old Aaron's eyes widened. I know a big sin that Keith did today. Annoyed, Keith turned to his little brother and said, you take care of your sins and I'll take care of mine. You know, all of us are pretty happy to talk about someone else's sins, someone else's flaws. We don't like to talk about our own. It's one of those words we'd rather not hear. Matter of fact, there are churches that have done away with the word sin because it's a turnoff for people. Well, author and pastor Gordon McDonald said, one of the interesting things about preaching to people from New York City is you don't have to spend much time convincing them that they are sinners. They know that they're wading waist deep in evil every day of the week. The city can bring out the worst from the depths of the soul. He says, when I preach in New York City on Sunday, I spend two minutes telling the people that they're sinners. When I preach in the suburbs, I spend 20 minutes saying the same thing. And here in Piscataway, we're out in the burbs. Well, none of us like to hear this nasty three-letter word, sin. Now, since we don't like the word, our culture has come up with all kind of other words around it. Instead, we say, like, I have a lot of faults. Uh, you know what? I have some shortcomings. I have hang-ups. Or we call them problems, mistakes. We say we're sick or we're dysfunctional. We don't like to use the word sin because it sounds ominous. To say we've sinned means that we are sinners. It sounds like a big deal and we don't want to make it a big deal. But this is a very dangerous position for us to take because sin is a big deal to God. It was such a big deal that he sent his only son to take care of this for us. Well, our text today is 1 John chapter 3. If you've been with us, you know we're going through this series on the book of 1 John. And uh, we come to verse 4 of chapter 3. He writes this, Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. Now, what law is he talking about here? Is he talking about the government's laws? No, he's talking about God's laws, his rules, his decrees. The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia references this very verse when it says that sin is breaking the law of God. Well, the message paraphrases the verse this way. All who indulge in a sinful life are dangerously lawless, for sin is a major disruption of God's order. So it's a violation of God's law. The Bible says we've all broken his laws. Romans 3, 23, that famous passage, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And God takes our sins seriously even if we don't, but we should. I mean, think about it. Even a small amount of sin compounded over a lifetime 
becomes an overwhelming deluge of it. If you just send once a day, and let's face it, there's not a person I've ever known that only sends once a day. One little lie, maybe one selfish moment, one lustful thought, uh, we all send more than once a day. But let's say it's just once a day. The average American lives over 28,000 days. So imagine standing before a judge. You say, Your Honor, I've been a law-abiding citizen. I have followed the rules. Occasionally I break them. Like 28,000 times I've broken the law. But judge, that's pretty good, you have to admit. <laughs> What's the judge going to say? You know, put him away, throw away the key. So sin, even for good people, is a real problem. This brings us to the nature of sin. It's rebellion. The verse we quoted from Romans 3, 23, it's described as falling short of the glory of God. Literally, sin means missing the mark of what God has for us. In our text, John describes sin as lawlessness. When we sin, we break God's law. It's an act of rebellion. The Bible teaches sin entered the human race through our original father, Adam. When he disobeyed, the entire human race was tainted with sin. All of us were corrupted, and since childhood, we have lived as part of that corruption. We've acted out, followed in Adam's footsteps. See, within each of us, there is this independent nature. We want to do what we want to do. We desire the things that we like. We want to be in charge of our lives, the master of our fate, the captain of our destiny. And ultimately, that leads to rebellion to lawlessness, to sin. It's important to understand the danger of sin. Sin destroys everything it touches. Marriages, children, relationships, our jobs, our other people. <clears throat> it is so destructive. In Leadership Magazine, Daniel Hans wrote, when John Belushi, the <clears throat> famous comedic actor, sorry, <clears throat> died of an overdose of cocaine, a variety of articles appeared, including one, he says, in the U.S. News and World Report on the seductive nature of cocaine. He says this, It can do you no harm and it can drive you insane. It can give you status in society and it can wreck your career. It can make you the life of the party and it can cause you to be a loner. It can be an elixir for high living and a potion for death. As the Eagles sang in their famous song about life in the fast lane, a song about partying and drugs, says it surely will make you lose your mind. Like all sin, there's a difference between its appearance and its reality, the momentary feeling and the lasting effect that it will have on you. The consequences of sin are twofold. There's the temporary, and then there's the long-lasting. There are consequences for the here and now, and then there are eternal consequences. And so Galatians chapter 6 warns us in verse 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Sin has an effect in the here and now. It ruins life. It destroys them. This is the danger of sin. We know there's consequences and you know, the sad fact is, even as believers, we often think we can escape them. Police cited a woman for speeding, hoping it would slow her down. Their hopes were soon shown to be in vain. Deputies from Lincoln County Sheriff's Department pulled over Chantel Wilson for driving her yellow 2018 Ford Mustang over the speed limit. She was going 92 in a 75. I know New Jersey people are like, that's hardly speeding, only 17. Well, they issued her her citation, and here's the thing, and, and the truth is I've never received a ticket. Uh, 36 years I've been driving, I'll probably get one on the way home today. I'll deserve it if I do. But uh, I know this, if I were pulled over and when I'm pulling away and there's a police car still behind me, I would like look carefully, turn signal, look again, pull out so slowly, and I would be so clear to them, I am not speeding again, officer. Instead, she floored it, took off in her Mustang, and eventually reached 142 miles an hour, almost double the speed limit. Eventually, 
deputies were able to pull her over. She resisted, and uh, eventually she was charged with willful, reckless driving. I guarantee she lost her license for a long time. And the question is this, what was she thinking? I mean, she was just pulled over. Like, that's not what you do. What else did she think was going to happen? And yet too often we do the same thing with the sin in our lives. We return to it. We know it will destroy us, yet we do it again and again. The message of our text today is that we must take sin seriously. Unless we do, we're never going to understand why Jesus had to come and to die for us. Verse 5. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins, and in him is no sin. He's the solution to our sin problem. The Bible teaches Christ became sin for us. Our text says he appeared so that he might take away our sins. Again, this shows how serious God takes sin. That he had to send his only son to die on the cross for us, to take care of our sin problem. Because we can't save ourselves. We needed a savior. So Christ had to come to make atonement for our sin. And it had to be a sinless sacrifice. As John says, in him is no sin. When he died on the cross, he was the perfect substitute, his perfection for our sin. And so now we're forgiven because of what Christ has done. But he came not only so we could be forgiven, but so we could have freedom from sin. The Bible says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. The eternal consequences of judgment are lifted. Now when we stand before God, we stand in the righteousness of Christ. God looks upon him and not upon our sin. We're literally clothed in his righteousness. It becomes ours, effective in us. He also sets us free from the power of sin. You know, it's great to be forgiven for past sins, but it's more amazing that also now he gives us the power to live for Christ, that we don't have to go back to the stuff that used to be part of us. Christ has broken the power of sin over us. Before we were slaves to sin, now we've been set free through Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in Romans 6 that we've been set free from sin and now we've become slaves to God. We now have the power to say yes to the Lord and no to sin. Well, verse 6, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. So what John is saying is it's impossible for anyone who's truly come to know the Savior, who has the Spirit of God living them, to continue to live in the same way they did before Christ came in. Now, I want to be clear. Joel's, uh, John is not talking about sinless perfection as if believers will ever reach a point where we won't sin. Matter of fact, in chapter 1, he said, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I know many godly people, they all still struggle and battle with sin. So again, the idea is not perfection, but it's that we are changing because Christ is in us. He's telling us our love for God, our desire to please him, will lead us to want to conduct ourselves differently. As we look forward to Christ's arrival, we want to stop gossiping with that uh, co-worker. We'll be motivated to no longer exaggerate. We'll find a renewed vision to get involved in our church family, to serve others. This love of God changes our heart. It changes how we live. It takes us out of that consumer mentality. What can the church do for me? What can other people do for me? And instead makes us say, Lord, what can I do for you? Father, today, how can I serve you and your kingdom and your people? It causes us to want to please him because we love him. See, when we lose sight of our final destination, we start to drift into lifestyle choices that don't honor God. We start living as if there were no moral absolutes. We start justifying that extra time we spend with that attractive coworker. We start uh, explaining away and making excuses for why we don't honor God with our money. We start rationalizing why we don't have time to seek God in prayer. Friends, we need to flee from the sin that's all around us. 
waiting to destroy us. In Leadership Magazine, Craig Wagner writes, on the TV show, show Hee Haw, which uh, my family watched as we were children, and some of you may have loved it, it was painful, but uh, anyway, Doc Campbell is confronted by a patient who says he broke his arm in two places, to which the doctor replies, well then, stay out of them places. Well, he may have something there. See, we can't regularly put ourselves in that place of temptation and then be surprised when we fall again. We need to take the doctor's advice and stay out of them places. We need to remember Jesus came to set us free from sin. Verse 8, the one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Christians, we're in a war, but it's not with other people. The sad thing is so often we make it that, and so often it's even with other Christians. What's clear here is we have an enemy. Now, this enemy is not some force. The enemy is a person, Satan, the devil. And we need to understand that even though many would like to say he no longer exists or never did exist, there's a tremendous amount of evidence that he does. D.L. Moody once said he knew the devil existed for two reasons. One, because the Bible says so, that's enough. But he said also because I've done some business with him. I think we all have. Well, quite apart from what the Bible teaches about Satan, we see it in our current world. I mean, we see it in the evil things that are done, the depravity that an adult could abuse a small child, that someone could go in and massacre kids in a school. These kind of things are just beyond understanding. They show that the evil one, Satan, is alive and well, even in our quote-unquote civilized society. While we, might, while we might be able to rationalize away some of the small acts of evil, we see the truth is he's real. So we've learned that sin is a reality in our world. Verse 8 tells us that sin is the fruit of Satan's labor. He's our real enemy. He's the one we must oppose and fight against. You see, Christ came not only to deal with sin, but also to deal with the devil. The last part of verse 8 tells us the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. And what's his work? Causing us to sin, to rebel against God, to refuse to submit to what he says. Sin will exact a devastating penalty. There are always terrible consequences. Verse 9, no one, he says, who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. So it's clear from these verses that those who practice sin are of the devil. Now again, John is not talking about people who fail. We all fail. There is not a believer out there that doesn't daily sin. And sometimes it's repetitive sin. But the difference is this. He's talking about ones who do it openly and who don't care anymore. Who basically say that my sin is my choice and I can do whatever I want. That there's no law that applies to me. John is not talking about a sin here and there, but about a lifestyle that integrates and excuses sin about a philosophy that allows a person to continue sinning without any remorse, without any desire to change. He says that this indicates such a person is not a Christian at all. Righteousness is a mark of a Christ-centered life. And so in verse 9 we read, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. So the teaching is clear here. True Christians are God's children. They've been implanted with a new nature. This new nature is pro-God, pro-righteousness, and anti-the devil and anti-sin. So if we've been born again, there should be a desire to avoid sin. Now again, he's not saying we'll never sin. He says, matter of fact, that they should not go on sinning. So again, here we're talking about habitual behavior, not occasional lapses. He doesn't expect perfection. 
He expects progress. As we go on with God, our faith should grow deeper. We'll never be sinless, but we should be falling further and further away from who we were. Now, I'll be honest, I worry in saying these things in a sermon because some of you have an overactive conscience. And you may even be wondering, am I truly a believer? Because there's that sin in my life that just I keep going back to it. And I want to be clear that the Bible allows that there is forgiveness. Again, the issue is this, are you sorry about your sin? Maybe not always sorry right away, but do you come back again and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I don't want to be this person. I don't want to do that thing. Because if so, then Christ is waiting with forgiveness. But he's also looking for people who will humble themselves. This is the key. Are you sorry for your sin? Will you acknowledge that you need the Savior's help to overcome it? What our text is saying is that we as believers cannot go on excusing sin. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to convict us when our heart becomes hard to soften it. Sin should still bother us. God's Spirit should still convict us. We will struggle with sin, but we should never excuse it or justify it or try to act like it's okay. We should be burdened to the point of confession and repentance. This is the evidence that Christ is in our lives, that the Holy Spirit is working in us. When we once again go back and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Wash me anew. Make me clean. Make me yours completely. See, we need to be on the lookout because Satan wants to deceive us. He wants to confuse us. He wants to convince us that sin is no big deal. We don't have to worry about it. That we won't fall. That we'll be okay. I think I've shared this before, but I remember reading Christian singer Steve Green, who for six years was with uh, Bill and Gloria Gaither doing their concert series, talked about the way that they did their concerts. The Gaithers were well known for doing what was known as concerts in the round. They would be in the center, and all around them would be the group worshiping with them, singing along with them, would be the, would be the congregation of those joining them. Now, this was a lot of work for the riggers, and the riggers are the people, men and women, who walk up there sometimes 100 feet above the concrete on these four-inch beams and hooking up the speakers and putting the lights. And so Steve Green said, the fellows I talked to weren't bothered by the sight of looking down 100 feet. What they didn't like, they said, were jobs in the buildings that had false ceilings, that is, acoustic tiles slung underneath the rafters. Why? Well, they said that these were too flimsy to hold them and they could still fall through, but they said their minds played tricks on them, lulling them into carelessness because it seemed like something safe was there to catch them. It was too easy to be lulled into complacency. Friends, Satan wants to do that. Sin's not a big deal. Everyone does it. We do. Everyone sins. It's true, but it doesn't make it okay. It doesn't make it all right. Satan's business is not so much scaring us to death as it is persuading us that the danger of a spiritual fall is minimal, that our sin isn't a big deal, that God may not even really notice it or care. But John warns us that a new seed is alive in those who know Christ, his life coming forth from us. So if we really know Jesus, then sin should bother us. And so my question for you is, does it? Is the Holy Spirit at work in your life convicting you? When you go back to that old sin, are you sorry? Are you surrendering to the Holy Spirit each day, saying, God, today I can't. Boy, my old nature still pulls, but today I want to live for you. Today I want to be yours completely. I want to encourage you, when you fall again, and you will, run back to your father who is waiting his arms outstretched for his children to come into his embrace into that forgiveness that is waiting i also want to say though maybe you're not truly a believer in jesus christ maybe you've never surrendered your life to him i would invite you even now to do that to let the savior come in and live in you to invite him to come in and forgive your sins, to make you that new creation. The good news for all of us is that Jesus Christ loves us. 
and that he is all about recreating us. We can't do it on our own, but through his power, it is possible. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now, and Lord, we admit that we are broken people. We have flaws. We do what's wrong, and it is called sin. And as much as our culture doesn't like that word, and we don't like that word, we acknowledge it's true. That we are so often willfully disobedient. We do that very thing that we know you hate so much. And so today we come again saying that we need forgiveness. We need your cleansing work in our life. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would be at work in us. I would ask that you would cause us to hate our sin. And also that when we do fall again, that we would go running back to the Savior, that we wouldn't run away from you in shame as Adam and Eve hid from you, but that we would go to you and admit what we've done and admit how desperately we need you. God, thank you for your amazing grace. Thank you for love that's beyond our understanding. Thank you for forgiveness that is... not know you as Savior, I pray even now that they would invite you in, that they would allow you to bring your cleansing forgiveness, that they would surrender their sin and their broken life to the one who can remake them today. And Jesus, we'd ask this all in your name. Amen. Sinners, the 
a ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. the Lord of all and that is our blessed hope the Messiah came to give us life that no matter what we've done no matter how how far away we have fallen from God he still loves us he's still there for us he still cares about us my prayer this week is that God would do a new and amazing work in you as Christian shared I hope you would join us for our zoom groups we have care groups and bible studies and uh, it's a Sunday school at 9 a.m. on Sundays. Great opportunities to grow. And also, as he said, I would challenge you to reach out to other people. Don't just be holed up in your home watching endless Netflix or television or whatever it is you do. But look for opportunities to make those phone calls and to reconnect and to let people know that you care. May God bless you this week and thank you so much for being with us this morning.